Our next candidate is Herman Cain, a businessman from Georgia. Herman Cain. Here comes Mr. Cain. Made his fortune in the pizza industry. Thank you. Mr. Cain, you have three minutes for your opening statement. Thank you very much. First, let me thank this distinguished panel for inviting me. Thank you, Jim. He didn't want me to call him Senator. Thank you all for being here, and thanks for this opportunity. Let's start with those first principles that you ask us to address, because that's a good way to describe where this nation is. I happen to believe that since the Declaration of Independence inspired the Constitution, that those first principles were in the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. The founders set the bar high. Even though maybe at the time we were not up at that bar, they set it high because they had a high vision for this nation. A second founding principle, that we are endowed by our creator, not men. That's one of those principles. Thirdly, with unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I happen to believe that the founders put those in that order for a reason. Because in this great nation of ours, we can pursue happiness all we want to, as long as we don't step on somebody else's liberty toes. We can have all the liberty to do what we want to do in this great nation, as long as we don't take away somebody else's life. Those are three of those first principles. But I happen to believe that the pursuit of happiness in America, which is part of, one of, part of those founding principles, is under attack. And the American people are saying that they want to take it back. And there's one more founding principle located in that document. And it's the one that says, when any form of government becomes destructive of those ideals, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. And that's what the American people are saying right now. We need to do some altering and abolishing. I'm a product of the American dream. I have exceeded all of my American dreams and then some. But it's under attack. And one of the reasons that I'm running for president of the United States is because I believe that God has blessed me with some abilities and skills in order to be able to help get this nation back on track. We have become a nation of crises. We have an economic crisis. We have an energy crisis. We have an immigration crisis. We have a foggy foreign policy crisis. And we have a severe deficiency of leadership crisis. And it's going to take a different kind of leadership in Washington, D.C. to lead this nation to solutions to those crises. My name is Herman Cain. I'm running for president because I believe that I can bring a unique set of leadership skills to the White House. Thank you, sir. And Representative King, you, believe, you begin this round of questions. Thank you, David. Thanks, Mr. Kane. I appreciate you being here. And I, uh, I would offer this question to you to start this out, and that would be that um, Ronald Reagan spoke eloquently of the shining city on the hill. Two centuries and more as he spoke. And my question is, are we still that shining city? And if so, is there another level for our destiny? And what would you do to take us there, and how would you define that to us? The answer is yes, we're still that shining city. Because the last time I checked, nobody was trying to sneak out of America. <laughs> they were trying to sneak into America. Despite our problems and despite our challenges, and we have a lot of problems. Here's how I would take the United States of America back to the top of the hill. But we're still on that point higher than any other country in the world. First, secure our national security strength. I happen to believe that this administration is weakening America militarily. This is not what Americans want. The world is not safer. So we should not be a weaker nation. For example, there's a lot of concern about Iran. When I was on the Citizen Advisory Board of the Strategic Air Command, today it's called STRATCOM, I became aware of many of our strategic military capabilities. 
we have capabilities that we can deploy around the world in order to help us and our friends to make sure that we keep them in check. And so the first thing is to secure our position in the world and make it clear that America will not weaken its military strength. My foreign policy approach is very simple. Clearly identify who our friends are. Clearly identify who our enemies are. And stop giving money to our enemies and stop telling the enemy what our next move is going to be in a particular country. But the second biggest challenge, the economy. So goes the economy, so goes the strength of the United States of America. We are the strongest economy in the world at our weakest point because of our free market system. And we need to re-strengthen that free market system. And it starts with one fundamental economic truth. The business sector is the engine of economic growth. If you do not start with that principle, we're never going to move this economy. This is why I have proposed my bold plan of 999. Take the current tax code, which is a mess, it's been here since 1913, throw it out and put in a, a tax system with a 9% corporate income tax, a 9% uh, tax on personal income, and a 9% national sales tax. I was about to ask you that question, Herman, and you offered the answer to it. But I, this other one, a question is posed when I listen to your response. Nobody is sneaking out of America. What do you do with those that are sneaking in? Those that are sneaking in, I believe we must first make sure we're working on the right problem. That's fundamental to my whole leadership style. I always challenge my staff when I was in business or anywhere, what's the right problem? What should the priority be? Do I have the right people around me? and then we can put together the right plans. Would you oppose amnesty in every form? I would oppose amnesty in every form because here are the four problems relative to immigration. It's not one, it's four. First, let's secure the border for real, not keep talking about it. Secondly, let's enforce the laws that are already on the books. Thirdly, I happen to believe that we can promote the path to citizenship that's already there. We simply need to clean up much of the bureaucracy that's preventing people from being inspired to come through the front door. And fourthly, what I would do with those illegal aliens that are already here, empower the states to do what the federal government can't do, hasn't done, and will not do. Okay, and, and then yet we have legal immigration, and America is the most generous country in the world with over a million a year legally coming into the United States. And in fact, uh, and is there such a thing as too many legal immigrants? What should that number be? Can we get too many? I don't believe that there are too many legal immigrants because we all came from somewhere. It's just a matter of where we have a need and where we have an opportunity. In some communities, there might be a number that says we don't want to overload the system. But I think one of the things that has made America great is its diversity. But Herman, but we have 50 million people in line in foreign countries waiting to come into the United States legally. So how many would be too many? I don't have an answer for that, Congressman, because I would have to look at, one, what type of qualifications do these 50 million people have? Secondly, what type of skills and education do they bring with them? If they're bringing us more problems than opportunities, then 50 million might be too many. Would you, though, be favorable towards establishing a legal immigration policy that rewarded merits of applicants? Yes. Rather Yes. And, and I very much appreciate that response. And uh, then, let's see, I was going to take you back to the tax situation yes. because I know you have to vent yourself on that, Herman. <laughs> phase one is the 999 plan, but phase two is to totally replace the tax code with the fair tax, which is a national sales tax. I have not given up on that idea. The reason that I'm not going to propose to do that as when I first become president is because we need to do a better job of informing and educating more of the American public so they can embrace and understand the paradigm shift from tax on income to tax on consumption. One of the biggest reasons, folks, that we need to get rid of the current tax code is because it allows bureaucrats to pick winners and losers. And it also costs the American people $430 billion a year just to pay your tax bill. Every time you send Uncle Sam a dollar, it costs you and me 30 cents to send in that dollar. Time's up. Thank you, sir.
Yes, sir. Professor George. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cain, for being with us uh, uh, today. Happy to be here. Uh, my uh, first question concerns our obligations to human life and also the constitutional powers of the respective levels and branches of uh, government. I want to preface it by recalling Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address. He was faced with an unconstitutional decision by the Supreme Court of the United States, the Dred Scott decision, which usurped the authority of the elected representatives of the people, the Congress and the, uh, and the President, and purported to bind their hands indefinitely and decisively. Now, many argue uh, today that we need a constitutional amendment to overturn the Court's usurpative decision in Roe versus Wade. However, we have what President Lincoln didn't have, which is a 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which was, of course, uh, ratified after Lincoln's uh, untimely death. And Section 5 of the 14th Amendment expressly authorizes the Congress, by appropriate legislation, to enforce the guarantees of due process and equal protection contained in the amendment's first section. So as someone who believes, as I know you do, in the inherent and equal dignity of all members of the human family, including the child in the womb, would you as president propose to Congress appropriate legislation pursuant to the 14th Amendment to protect human life in all stages and conditions, even short of a constitutional amendment overturning Roe versus Wade? Yes, I could support that. And because would you be prepared to confront the Supreme Court if, uh, if it came to that, take your case to the American people? I would take my case to the American people, but first, let the Congress challenge the United States Congress to do its job. I have a great amount of respect for our system. I, don't, I believe that the President has a responsibility to be President, which means national security, number one priority. Secondly, the President has a responsibility to preserve, protect, and enforce the Constitution of the United States of America, not try and rewrite it. I don't believe we need to rewrite it and don't try to work outside of it like we'll see in this current administration. And then thirdly, provide the strategic leadership on all of these issues that we face, which means setting a real clear agenda, a people's agenda, with the United States Congress, and then engaging the American people in the solutions to many of the problems we face, not creating legislation that's so big and complicated that the American people are left out of the loop. Let me ask you a question about religious freedom and the uh, freedom of conscience, the rights of conscience. Uh, in the state of Illinois, after uh, the legislature there passed a civil unions bill, which the governor signed into law, the state government decided to exclude certain religiously affiliated foster care and adoption agencies, including Catholic and Protestant agencies, uh, because those agencies, in line with the teachings of their faith, cannot in conscience place uh, children with same-sex partners. Now, at least half of Illinois' foster and adoption funds, it turns out, come from the federal government. So my question is whether the federal government should be subsidizing states that discriminate against Catholic and other religious uh, adoption agencies. No, because I believe in the First Amendment. So the federal government should not be subsidizing any situation where it's discriminatory against any legitimate religion in this country. Okay. Uh, I'm going to shift now to the question of marriage. Uh, all the major candidates uh, for the presidency in 2012, including President Obama, uh, share the position that marriage is properly defined in our law as the union of husband and wife. How does your own position differ from President Obama's position on that issue? And what would you do as president to uh, defend marriage so defined? The first thing that I would do is make it clear that I support the Defense of Marriage Act that was passed in 1996. I support that. Uh, secondly, I happen to believe that the President of the United States, and I do support traditional marriage. No question about that. I always have I've been consistent on that. And so I happen to believe that in addition to being the commander in chief, in addition to being responsible for the safety and security of this country, I also believe that the president is communicator in chief to talk about some of these values that our founding fathers got right. And I think that we ought to be the defending fathers in order to be able to do that. So I would use that platform as president to encourage some of those values that we know that the founding fathers embraced. Uh the data now seems very clear, very clearly uh, to show a high correlation between poverty and the breakdown of a, of a marriage culture. Yes. Where we have the breakdown of the marriage culture, we have 
poverty. Uh, I'm a person who believes that the Republican Party should be in the vanguard of fighting poverty. We should be an anti-poverty issue. But it seems to me that that means we need to be in the vanguard of rebuilding the marriage culture. It seems the two greatest engines to fight poverty ever created, created by man are the market system, the free market system, a yes. vibrant economy, and the institution of marriage. I think we have a pretty good idea of what you would do to make us vibrant again economically. What can we do to rebuild the marriage culture, especially in poor and disadvantaged communities? I think we have to stop incenting broken homes. We have to stop incenting young women to have more babies to get more money from the government. I believe that we have got to empower communities rather than making them more entitled to the government. Here's an example. Uh, the city of Detroit, for example. The city of Tro Detroit, in my opinion, is a big, big could be a big empowerment zone. When people are able to help themselves economically, then they are not forced to do some of the other things that contributes to the breakup of the marriage. It starts with a strong economic engine with opportunities for jobs, opportunities for entrepreneurship for people, and then I believe we will see a ripple effect in helping to rebuild the family structure in this country. Uh, Mr. Kane, finally, uh, will you choose as your running mate for vice president someone who shares your pro-life and your pro-marriage convictions? Absolutely. Good. Thank you. Absolutely. Senator DeMint. Herman. Jim. Thank, thanks for being here. Sounds good, doesn't it, Herman? <laughs> Jim. Um, probably the biggest uh, economic problem we face um, as a nation is our level of debt. Um, the spending, the borrowing, the debt is out of control. As you know, our debt's the size of our total economy, and the plans are continue to add to the debt right. despite the so-called uh, debt limit debate deal that we had. What would you do to reduce our debt in the short term and the long term? Have you seen proposals that would uh, move it in the right direction, or do you have one? What, what are we going to do to move away from adding to our debt? Two things. First, we must boost economic growth. We can do that. This economy has the capacity. I know that bold tax changes like I'm talking about, even some of the other candidates are talking about, they will work. Let's look at the decade of the 60s, they worked under John F. Kennedy. They worked in the 80s. We must first get this economy growing upwards to a 5 or 6% GDP growth rate. And the way I would go after cutting the cost and the debt is the same way I have gone into companies when I've had to take over a business that might have been failing. First, an across the board cut of pick a number, 10%. Then the hard work of a deep dive in every agency to eliminate programs that are in fact duplicative, outdated, based upon performance metrics and eliminate a lot of those programs. The government accounting office, as you know, Jim, they routinely identify many of those things, but nothing is ever done. They are never actually acted upon. They're not going to be acted upon by 535 members of Congress. They're going to have to be acted upon with the leadership of the president. So that would be my approach. We would have to do a deep dive on every agency and find those, and then get serious about restructuring the big programs like Social Security. I believe in a personal retirement accounts approach. The country of Chile, they had the same problem nearly 30 years ago. They went to an optional personal retirement account, account approach, and they now have individual retirement accounts for their workers. And so we must restructure programs, not just continue to trim around the edges to begin to bring how, it down. How do you know how much to cut? What's the goal? The goal is to cut deep until we are spending less than what we're bringing in. That's the, that would be the target. That's what I'm trying to get to. Yeah, what do you yeah. think about a balanced budget uh, and do we need a constitutional amendment to balance the budget? I believe in a balanced budget amendment, yes, because otherwise we're not going to have the discipline in Washington in terms of collectively of getting there. All you have to do is look at, you know, the current situation uh, in terms of what's being discussed with the super committee. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea in Washington, D.C., for some, not you, not Congressman Steve, but some people is, if you reduce the growth, that's a cut. That's not a cut. 
Yeah. That's, that's deceiving the American people. So no, I do believe in a balanced budget amendment. Let's talk about the Federal Reserve. Uh, the more I find out, the more worried I am about what they've been doing. We found out when we went through the legislative process to, uh, for this TARP program, which, which I opposed, um, the Federal Reserve actually uh, matched that and, and upped it uh, as far as the amount of money they were sending to banks, not only in this country, but around the world. Uh, they've apparently bought nearly 90 percent of our own debt this year. And now they're talking about another round of monetizing debt, which they call quantitative easing. I mean, what would you do with the Federal Reserve, or do you think it's a problem? I believe we can fix the Fed. And the way we fix the Fed is we ask Congress to limit their ability, to limit their authority. One of the reasons they, they got into these programs like quantitative easing is because of the size of the debt and because the debt was just spiraling out of control. And other countries were not buying it fast enough. They came up with these kinds of plans. Secondly, the Federal Reserve has, unfortunately, a dual mission, monetary stability and unemployment. That's like trying to hit two targets with one arrow. I would ask Congress to take away one of the targets, get them back to what they were commissioned to do back in 1913, and it worked well until we got into this situation relative to the debt that we have. I believe that we can fix the Fed by asking Congress to relimit their authority to do those kinds of things. Secondly, secondly, we have got to get back to sound money. Our dollar is suffering. It's similar to when we wake up in the morning, an hour is 60 minutes. We don't have to go look in the paper to see what it's worth. We've got to get back to a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. Do you need a gold standard to do that? Yes, we do need a gold standard to do that. We can work our way back to a standard. That's the only way we are going to make our currency the, the dependence, the, the, the currency that people around the world depend upon. So yes, I do support establishing standards. And there are many ways to do it in addition to a gold standard. We've got a minute. I don't have time to ask a question you to answer it, so I'll give you a minute for a closing remark. How about that? This whole election, folks, is about the survival of this nation and about our liberties. And President Ronald Reagan used to remind us about this thing called freedom. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It must be fought for and protected. Or one day we are going to spend our sunset years telling our children and our grandchildren what the United States of America used to be like. I'm not going to have that conversation with my grandkids. And I don't think the American people want to have that conversation with their grandkids. I'm running for president of the United States because it's not about us. It's about the grandkids. Time's up. Thank you, Herman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Herman Cain. Appreciate it. He must have been in the military. Thank you.